Well, all right, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm going to open us up in a word of prayer, and then we will jump on in. Father God, we uh, once again thank you for the opportunity to be gathered here together. We pray that you would bless us in this time. Uh, we ask God that as we reflect on these things that you would uh, give us insight. Uh, we, we are here because we desire for your church to witness well to Christ. Uh, we confess that we often don't do that. And we have a history of often not doing that. And it is our desire that uh, you would inspire us, call us to uh, continue our pursuit of you in a way that does reflect Jesus well to this world. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So um, we are thinking about what it means to be evangelical, thinking about if we want to be evangelical, if we, what do we do with that word, and, and what, what do people do with that word. So we've been kind of working through, preparing some ground. Uh, uh, we've been talking about the crisis of evangelicalism, hopefully by now. You know we're talking about it's a crisis of identity and a crisis of mission. Uh, and my, my thesis is that the crisis of evangelicalism is rooted in the evangelicalism's, in evangelicalism's lack of a ecclesiology, a vision of the church. And be, because we don't have a clear vision of the church, we don't know who we are, the struggle we have with our identity, because we don't know who we are, we don't have a clear understanding of who we are as the church, we don't therefore have a clear understanding of our role in the world, our mission. And if you don't have a clear understanding of your mission, then you give yourself to all kinds of missions that you think should be your mission, or that you wonder is your mission, or that you feel like ought to be your mission. And so we've been thinking together about what is the identity of the church. We did that a couple of weeks ago. It's a little jumbled in my mind because of the polar vortex, but whatever that was, two sessions ago, uh, we talked about the identity of the church. The, the, the church is the presence of the new in the midst of the old. And then last week we were thinking about the mission of the church, and that was kind of setting up uh, the conversations we're going to be having over the next few weeks around tonight politics, next week race, and then our last week will be on sexuality. Uh, what is the relation of the new to the old? How does this play itself out in our relationship to the world around us? How does a, an ecclesiology, developing a stronger ecclesiology, help us think about what our relationship is to the world around us? So then last week, if you'll recall, spent a chunk, a chunk of time working through First Peter, uh, and I suggested that for me, or I, I, I let you all know that for me, First Peter has been a, uh, a very important text, a letter for helping me think through the relationship between the church and the world. And what we find in First Peter is a calling from Peter to the churches that he's writing to, and we began by what Peter, he immediately comes out of the gate saying, you are a chosen people. Uh, and then he said, you are exiles in the world. You are scattered in the world. And so we walk through what Peter is, is identifying when he's talking about these things and how the church is to understand itself. And then in, in 1 Peter 2, you get to what, first, what Peter says about the church being a holy nation. And you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. That what he is saying there is you don't belong to the nations that you live in. You don't belong to the national groups where you reside. You are a holy nation, set apart for a mission, set apart for a purpose. You live in those places. You are supposed to live in those places, but you need to understand that who you are shapes how you live in those places. So we're reflecting on what it means to be, a little bit of, of what it means to be a holy nation. We're going to come back to that tonight. 
Then also Peter says stuff like, honor the emperor. You're a holy nation. Honor the emperor. And so we kind of ended with that last week of, what does this say about our understanding of the church's relationship to the political, to the world around us? We're a holy nation. We don't belong in our fundamental identity to the nation in which we live. But we are also called to have a relationship to that nation, to that world. <coughs> and as Peter describes it, it is a relation in, in, in which we are to honor the emperor. He doesn't say attack the emperor. He doesn't say overthrow the emperor. He says honor the emperor. And, and so kind of left it there last week with that little bit of tension of what it means for us to be a holy nation doesn't belong to the nation in which we live, but also have a relationship with the nation around us. And so that's what I want to pick up tonight and kind of work through now thinking specifically about evangelicalism and politics. And so we're going to work through some stuff. If you've been involved in some of the couple series I've done over the last few years, the um, Sabbath politics series that we did in the fall of 2016, leading up to the election of, of 2016, in the fall of 2017, we did a series called the Sabbath Church. Some of this, I'm, I'm bringing some material from that into this to kind of uh, feed that into what we're talking about here. So some of this may sound familiar if you've been involved with that, but hopefully it's packaging it in a way and, and encouraging us to think in a way that will keep moving us forward. So how do we define politics? How do we define politics? The classic definition of politics comes out of Aristotle in his book called Politics, which is really the first philosophical sustained reflection on politics in the Western world. And Aristotle continues to be consulted in this. And maybe you've heard this very famous line that comes out of this book. Uh, Humanity is a political animal. So Aristotle says, humanity is by nature a political animal. Now what he means by that is not humanity by nature desires to vote. Right? We have this kind of core thing where we have to vote. What he means by that is, as he goes on to say, anyone who either cannot lead the common life or is so self-sufficient as not to need to and therefore does not partake of society is either a beast or a god. What he's saying is, by nature, humans live together. We are, by our nature, societal. We are communal. We group together. We gather together. We are structured in families. We are structured in villages. We are structured in towns. We are structured in states. That By our nature, we commune together. We have relationship with one another. And that that's essential to defining what it means to be human. And so when Aristotle here says politics, when he says that we are a political animal, what he's saying is we are communal people. We are a communal people. So the Greek word polis means city or community. So he's saying by nature we live in community with one another. Now, in order for that to be the case, then there have to be things that make that living together workable. There have to be things in place to make that living together work. So as we think about what politics is, kind of at the biggest level, big picture, meta level here, I would define politics as the ordering of communal life with the aim of human thriving. The ordering of of human life, if we're gonna live together, then we have to have some order to that. The ordering of human life But that ordering serves a purpose. That purpose is human thriving, the human good. So the ordering of communal life with the aim of human thriving. Now, if that's the case, that necessitates at least two things that we have to have, that we have to share together if we are going to live in community together, if we're going to be a political entity. There are two things by necessity that have to be in place. The first is we have to have a communal understanding of what it means to be to thrive. 
we have to agree at some level about what it means to, to thrive, what the goal is of our life, what the goal is of being human. And then the second thing that needs to be in place is there needs to be a structure that aims to achieve that thriving. There have to be structures in place that promote that definition of thriving that we are pursuing. And so we have to have a common agreement about what it means to thrive. What does it mean to be human? What is our purpose? We have to have a common agreement about that. And then we have to have agreed upon structures in place that promote that. You with me? Doing all right? Okay. All right, so we've got to have those things in place. Now, something that uh, we should observe is that this applies from small tribes, <coughs> nomadic peoples, small tribes living in, in uh, the Amazon jungle, from those communities to a nation state with the complexity of the United States. Now, those things are going to look different. The vision of thriving is going to look different. The structures needed to pursue that are going to look different. But in every communal grouping, these things need to be in place. And if you don't have them in place, then what happens? Society doesn't work. And so what you see at key points throughout history is that there are times and places where a vision of a common vision of thriving or the structures to achieve that, or both start to break down and societies start to break down and people have to rethink, who are we? What are we doing? And, and how do we get there? And, and this is what you see when you see political revolutions. This is what you see when you see the, the, uh, the dislocation of societies, when you see the dissolution of societies, that something has broken down here. Okay, so now that leads us to some questions. Well, what is thriving? Right? What does it mean to, to, to thrive? Last, the last series I did called Sabbath Church, we thought about this in terms of um, what we thought about as common objects of love. That, that when people group together we group together because we have some shared common objects of love. And those shared common objects of love are shared values, shared goals, a vision of human purpose, objects of affection, things that we love, things that we will sacrifice for, things that we worship, that we gather around these common objects and we share together an affection of value for these common objects. These common objects carry meaning for us. They carry purpose for us. We tell stories that carry that meaning and carry that purpose. <coughs> that these things unify us people as a pulse, as a community gathered around something and some things. So those of you who are in the Sabbath church series may remember when we did this, I asked, I'm going to ask it again tonight, what are the common objects of love of the United States? What are the, what are the things that we value? What are the stories that we tell that carry meaning and purpose for us? Sports. Sports. Okay. Yeah. Capitalism. Capitalism. Okay. Freedom. Independence. Independence. You said freedom. Yep. Independence, freedom. Symbols. What are the symbols of that that Flags. we flag? Oh, pursuit of happiness. The pursuit of happiness. Okay. The eagle. Freedom of religion. Freedom of religion. Yeah. So these are our values that historically have been what the common objects of love for the political entity called the United States of America have been. Now, I'm going to suggest in a minute that we're in a time where that sharing of those common objects uh, isn't coming so easily 
for us, for the United States. We're in a time right now where there's a lot of questioning of what our common objects are and who have those common objects served and who have those common objects left behind and what do we do with that? And so that's a pivotal moment where we find ourselves in, in one of these moments where, the, where society is wondering and is questioning and people are pushing on some of these questions about our common objects of love. And do they work? And what ought we to do with the fact that they work for some, but they don't work for others, when one of our common visions is equality, and yet the very structures of society seem to be creating inequality, have created and continue to create inequality. We'll talk about wealth inequality in a minute. What do we do with that? And so we're living at a very, I think, interesting, important time for these conversations that are going on. So then, when we have these common objects of love, the way that we can define thriving is when the polis, when we together are living uh, in a pursuit of these common objects, we're finding meaning and we're finding purpose through these common objects. And our community is being strengthened, our polis is being strengthened because the common objects are functioning well, the common objects are working, the common objects are promoting good. But again, then the question is, what happens when they don't? What happens when people start to question that? What happens to our polis when that takes place? Okay, so that's the qu first thing. What is thriving? How do we define thriving? The second thing is, what are the authoritative structures that we need to have in place? in order for that thriving to happen. So you think about a complex society like a nation state. What are the stuff, the things that we have to have in place? Well, we have to have a rule of law. We have to have people who monitor that rule of law. We have to have governmental authority who sets the rule of law. We have to have education by which people are not just educated, um, the, the, the educational part of education, but also the, the civics part of education. What does it mean for you to be a, a member of this, of this polis? Um, unfortunately, we need tax revenue, because if we're gonna do this, sorry Andy, but uh, if, we, if we're gonna have this stuff, we're gonna have law, we're gonna have police, we're gonna have governmental authority, we're gonna have education, we gotta pay for that. And we have to share that paying amongst the polis, amongst the people. We need a military, you gotta pay for that. That military that will protect our common objects. We have to have structures in place that protect the common objects that we love. And so we create structures for that to take place. We have to have societal norms of behavior. How is it appropriate to behave in the society? And how is it inappropriate to behave? in the society. And of course, then, one of the questions that arises and is arising very much today, who gets to decide what is appropriate and what is inappropriate? What are the authoritative structures by which we make those decisions? How does that play out in our, in our polis? So these structures are, are, are fundamental to protecting the common objects. And these structures have a role of shaping our communal behavior. Now, I have some good news. Good. You ready for some good news? Hey. Here's the good news, and it's actually veiled bad news, but that's okay. It's, I'm going to present it as good news. The good news is that we as evangelicals aren't the only ones who are facing crisis. Yes. Right? We're not alone in the crisis that we're facing. And there is a lot being written today. There is a lot being reflected on today. There is a lot in the politics of the United States today that people are reflecting on and thinking about what has been called the crisis of Western liberalism. That the political, the the political philosophy that undergirds the United States, the political philosophy that undergirds the West is in crisis. And there is deep reflection going on about what do we do about that? Things aren't working. Um, hypocrisies are being called out. 
structures that, as we said, structures that have worked for some but not for others are being questioned. There is a crisis of Western liberalism, and it's seen in all kinds of ways, but just a few things here. The rise in populism and authoritarianism that we see in the world today, what one uh, political philosopher has called, we're in a democratic recession. And he doesn't mean Democrat the party, he means right. democracy. That between 1975 and 2010, the world went from 35 democracies to 110 democracies. Since 2010, that number is going backwards. Right? We're, we're, we're going backwards in the number of democracies in the world today. And you can see that in, in Eastern Europe, this is one of the key drivers of this, was after the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, Western philosophy, Western democracies came in, sought to establish democracy in these places. And in some places it's worked, and in other places it hasn't, and they have fallen back into more authoritarian kinds of, of, uh, of structures. And you can see this in Latin America, you can see this in Asia, it's, it's, it's going on around the world. What's that? So 1975 to 2010 went from 35 to 110 democracies. And now I don't know the exact number of how many are, are, are in play. You know, there is Russia a democracy. Well, they call themselves a democracy. They have elections. They're not exactly the kind of elections we would say are free elections, the kind of elections. So, you know, how do you define democracy? Just because you have voting doesn't mean you have a functioning democracy. But the, the, the observation is we're going backwards on that. Uh, what has been described as political total war that's going on in Washington, D.C., right? Scorched, uh, scorched earth ways that the parties are relating to one another. Rejection of compromise. If you compromise, that's giving in. If you compromise, you're selling out. That kind of, of uh, mentality that we see in Washington, D.C., across the, the political spectrum. Even within the individual political parties. Yes, yes, within the, yeah, the wings and the parties and how those aren't functioning right. in relationship to one another. Yeah, you're right. So then, uh, the third thing is coming to terms with uh, bringing out of the, the corners and the darkness the history of racism, sexism, and xenophobia that has been part of Western liberalism from the very beginning. Not just the United States, but the whole ph philosophical tradition of Western liberalism with the idea of equality, but equality has meant equality of certain groups, not equality of, of everybody. And so now there's a, a reckoning of people uh, pushing at, really, let's talk about this history. Let's really understand the structures of the, of the culture and, and how those have benefited some and hurt others, and what do we do about that? What's xenophobia? Xenophobia is the fear of a foreigner, fear of, fear of others, right? So it's, and that, and that leads to the next one, which is immigration and nationalism. Of course, we are right now in the midst of a, I don't know if it's quite, we could call a national conversation. I'm not sure what to call it because it doesn't seem to be much of a conversation. Uh, we're in the midst of a lot of dialogue or not dialogue or whatever we're doing about, about immigration, about what happens at the southern border. We're not, that's not unique to the United States. This exploded in Europe in, in the summer of 2015 with the Syrian refugee crisis and all these refugees landing in Italy, and Italy can't handle them all. What is the EU going to do? There are certain member states of the EU that, that were open to taking refugees. There are other member states of the EU that weren't. This spurred uh, significant conversations in the European Union. Ultimately, one of the key factors of Brexit, which also we're dealing with today, they're trying to figure that out by March 29th. What does it mean to leave the EU? That is a, in many ways, a response to this, this immigration. And then the larger question of what is a nation state? And, and, and what is national sovereignty? And who is us? And what does us mean when immigrants are pouring into the country in ways that we can't really manage or understand what the impacts of this are going to be? And so it has sparked nationalist kinds of responses, nationalist conversations. Right. You know, I was just going to say um, and the importance of defining terms that I think um, 
these things that have phobia <laughs> at the end of them, um, people who have concerns are then labeled phobic about what they have concerns about. Yeah. And it's, so it's turned out to be a very pejorative term. So yeah, I, I think that's right. Xenophobia is just kind of a you know long long standing kind of philosophical word. It may have some so freight with it now. Homophobia. Right. For right. Example. Right. Yeah. You know, I'm not afraid. Right. Yep. Yep. So fair enough. We'll um, we'll we'll take that under consideration mm -hmm. as we continue our our conversation. The, the, the next thing then is uh, the growing divide between the rich and the poor. Yeah. It's estimated that by 2030, the richest 1% will own 60 per, 66% of all the wealth in the world. Say that again, please. By 2030, the richest 1% will own 66% of the wealth in all the world. That divide is not getting closer. Yeah. You're not, we're not seeing the rich and the poor coming closer. We're seeing the rich and the poor and in, in markedly dynamic terms, continuing to divide uh, from, from one another. So wealth is being concentrated in particular places. Now, one of the things I, I, I wanna, I, I'm not making, I'm not here to make, my purpose here is not to make a, a, a judgment on any of these things about immigration, about the wealth divide. That, and these are the kinds of things that are happening that are driving significant conversations about what's going on in Western liberalism. What's going on in our political life? What's going on to this philosophy, as we'll talk about in a little bit, this philosophy that is about the liberation of the individual. What is it actually doing? And what is it actually done? And in new ways, those questions are being asked. <coughs> I was just wondering if you think that the growth in communication is adding to the problem. Maybe people could live in bliss and not know any of this was going on. <laughs> so, um, I think technology, which I, I don't have, we don't have time for here. I think technological factors, mobility factors, all of those things are are very much contributors to this. And so the the question of the relationship between economics, politics, and technology is is a, a critical part of what's going on here so yeah i think you're right i think that there were ways if, if you if you were in a particular class in the 18th century or 19th century you knew pretty much what was going on in your village you knew what was going on and maybe in your county you didn't know what was going on in the broader world except very very small minor snippets. You might hear about Napoleon and Waterloo. You might hear about this or the other. That was way over there. That was way over there. And also, I think ed the educational level is, is also a significant part of this. Um, and, and so I think all of that is, is, is contributing to <coughs> this reflection on the tradition of Western liberalism. Yeah. Just from my own life, in the 1950s, I was being raised on a farm in Iowa. I'd never been to a big city. Yeah. Then I marry a Navy man and we go to San Francisco and it's like I'm in a new world. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know this even existed yeah. because television hadn't shown me that. Right, right. And, and so yeah. it's yeah. like going right. to a store and seeing things you didn't know you wanted. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. didn't I was didn't know it was there. Healthier. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ignorance is bliss. Yeah. Okay. And now uh, we don't have the option of ignorance. And we, we can understand how the world works in ways that maybe we didn't before. And what do we do with that? Maybe what do we do with that? <coughs> I think we have to wrestle through. Yeah, yep. we have to wrestle. Did I see a hand coming up over here? Yeah. Wayne. I was going to say, it, I think it also is worth remembering or commenting that everything on that list was probably true for many generations before us. And that this country's always had some immigrant group that it hated. Yep. Uh, there's always been racism. I mean, it, yep. I, I, yeah. None of this is new. Yeah. That's 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 my, that's my point. But I, I, and I agree. I think what what is unique is say something like this: the rise in populism and authoritarianism. There was a book written in 1989 called "The End of History." Um, and the idea there was that, so we can get into some 
there's a, a little bit of philosophy behind this. Hegel's philosophy was thesis, antithesis, synthesis, right? That there's, there's a thesis <coughs> of how the world works, and something arises in opposition to how that world works, and the two of those then communicate with each other or bash against each other, and a new thing emerges from that. And this is how history moves forward. What this book in 89 was saying is be, with the fall of communism, the only thing left now is democracy. That communism has been defeated. And so there's the end of history because they're not saying that the world's going to end, but he's saying the anticipation at that point was that with the fall of communism, the only option is liberal democracy. And the world will adopt this. Fraser is just at that point. Yes, well that's exactly right. And so then this now, when, when people have that mentality, now the retreat from that, people start to go, well, what, what's going on now? Why are countries moving back to authoritarian structures? What, what is that about? Um, and I think it's in this moment in time, we're reflecting on these things in a, in a new way and in a different way. So I, I agree, this, this isn't new, but it is it's how we're reflecting on it now in a way that's causing people to raise fundamental questions about the political philosophy underneath these things. Is that, yeah, that makes sense? All right. Okay, so now let's think together about what is the root of the crisis of Western liberalism. What things are becoming apparent? What things are we understanding about Western liberalism that maybe perhaps we didn't understand? And then, how should this impact our understanding of evangelicalism and the way that we interact with politics, our relation to politics? John, yeah. could you just say a couple words about what aspect of liberalism is applying to this situation? You're, you're saying liberal willing to change as opposed to conservative wanting to stay with the status quo? No, well, no, so I'm, just, I'm talking about the, the underlying political philosophy that's called Western liberalism, that uh, what I don't mean by that is the liberal conservative spectrum yeah, within American politics. Um, I think when I, I'm gonna define liberalism here, what oh, I mean okay. by it, so okay, I, I, think that will, I think that will help as we, as we move forward. Okay, so what is the root of the crisis of Western liberalism? There's a, a book that, that came out last year by a uh, he's a political scientist at Notre Dame. His name is Patrick Deneen. He's written a book called Why Liberalism Failed. Um, and it's, it's m made some, uh, some headlines and kind of a splash into these conversations. He says this, liberalism has failed because it has succeeded. <laughs> liberalism has failed because it has succeeded which may sound like a bit of a yeah. contradiction. I'm very, I'm so, <laughs> so what does he mean? Well, he goes on to say this. He says, as, liberal, as liberalism has become more fully itself, as, as liberalism has started to move to its logical conclusion, right? we've had Western liberalism for, say, 300 years, but it's taken that long for some of the logical conclusions of Western liberalism to really start to play out. So as that started to play out, it's become more fully itself, its inner logic has become more evident. We, we understand better the inner logic of it and its self-contradictions manifest. So what Deneen's argument is that we are now living at a place in history where the, the inner meaning of liberalism has come to be seen as well as the contradictions that we can understand them better now. We understand the fruit of liberalism now in ways that over the last few hundred years we hadn't because as any human ideology does, it plays itself out. And his argument is no human ideology uh, is eternal. And so we shouldn't think that liberalism is eternal. And so he's reflecting on what that could mean and what that would look like moving forward. Okay. So it's, it, as liberalism has become more fully itself, its inner logic has become more evident and its self-contradictions manifest. 
his argument is we're living in the time where the self-contradictions of liberalism are coming to be seen broadly, understood broadly, and that's having significant effects in our politics and in our, the conversations and in our polis. Those contradictions are playing themselves out in our polis. And that's what we're experiencing in this time in which we're living. And different people are responding to those different contradictions in different ways. Doug? Would, would uh, today's headlines about El Chapo be an example of that? He, he was a, an extreme capitalist. Right. But that's the only reason, right? It's not yep. that he probably wasn't a drug addict himself. Right, right. But yet, the, the capitalist liberalism, or is it the other way around? Liberal capital must be capitalist liberalism. Yeah, I think it's way. He's an example of it. Yeah. And if you take capitalism, you know, to, to its logical saying, conclusion, to its logical yep. or, or its extreme right. conclusion, this is what you get. Right. right. Uh, that might be an example. I don't know if it is or not. But I, I think I think so. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And I, and I don't. I don't want to get deeply into capitalism and economics, though maybe we should do that at some point in time. But certainly these are all related, very much related to one another. Uh, and, you know, in the, just in the last few weeks, we're starting to see uh, people who are calling for the United States to become more socialist. And that's elicited a tremendous response from people on both sides. What does that mean? What, what do we do with that? What's driving that? So, uh, and again, I don't want to dive deeply into that, but that's just to point out that uh, we're in a time right now where people are thinking about stuff that haven't been thought about at any kind of real uh, authoritative level. Of course, there's been socialists in the United States, there's been communists in the United States, but the way that that conversation is taking place now is a different level of conversation than it ever has been in the history of the United States. Capitalism has been a given throughout the history of the United States. It's not a given for particularly younger folks. And so why is that, right? What's going on there? Okay. So let me define liberalism. And, and again, I'm talking here about the political philosophy that undergirds the Western democracy, Europe, and, and the United States. Of course, liberalism is rooted in a rejection of monarchy, a rejection of aristocracy, rejection of the rule of the elites. Prior to the development of Western liberalism in the philosophies of people like Jean-Jacques Rousseau and John Locke and Thomas Jefferson, uh, prior to these political philosophers, the world throughout its history, even what we would look back and described as democracy in Athens, Athenian democracy, Greek democracy. Greek democracy was very different than Western liberal democracy. Um, prior to this, human societies were structured in, the way that, in, in a way that the few had power over the many. And that could be a, a, a monarchical society, that could be an arist aristocratic society, be a Plutarch society, whatever it, whatever it is, there were, and there are different ways of it, but the few had power over the many. The promise of liberalism was that you take the power of governance and you spread it out among the many. And the many had the right to rule. The many had the opportunity to exercise their authority in the way that the polis operates. So the promise of liberalism is in a rejection of monarchy, aristocracy, the rule of the elites, you have now the rule of the many. It's called liber uh, liberalism because the promise is a liberation. A liberation of, of what? A liberation of the many from the arbitrary rule of the few. A liberation of individuals from inherited customs that, that we didn't choose. Uh, Patrick Deneen, in, in, a, in a lecture I heard him give, he talked about, you just think about the names that have come down through, the, through history. If your last name is Weaver, 
your last name is Taylor, if your last name is Smith, why do you have that name? As your occupation. As your occupation, and you were born into that occupation. And for most people, if you were born into the Taylors, you were going to become a Taylor. And there were customs and expectations that you didn't choose, it was just the way that the world worked. And so you didn't, as an individual, have the own your right or opportunity to choose your own path, to choose your own way. Liberalism, as a political philosophy, rejects the idea of inherited custom, unchosen authoritative structures or norms. The, the best political philosophy lecture on this that you can get is in Monty Python and the Holy Grail, where King Arthur shows up with the peasants. Do you guys know this scene? We have some Monty Python fans out here. And he says, I am Arthur, King of the Britons. And one of the peasants says, King of the who? And Arthur says, King of the Britons. He says, well, who are the Britons? We all are the Britons, and I am your king. Well, I didn't vote for you. <laughs> and then Arthur says, well, you don't vote for the king. And then the peasants say, well, how did you become king then? And Arthur talks about how the lady in the lake held forth Excalibur, den you know, denoting that he was king. And the peasant says, well, look, some woman laying in ponds distributing swords is not the basis for a system of government. And this is not how it should work. So it's, a, it's a wonderful <laughs> description of the interaction between liberalism and authoritarianism that only Monty Python could make that entertaining <laughs> and, that, and that fun, right? The peasant saying, well, I didn't vote for you. It's so funny because it's so out of place, right, with, with monarchy. And they're an authoritarian commune or, or an autonomous commune. <coughs> they, they describe their own political system there. In Life of Brian. In, yeah, Life of Brian goes, <laughs> definitely Marxist. goes further. Yes, Life of Brian definitely goes further in lots of ways. <laughs> Life of Brian goes further. But anyway, it's, I didn't vote for you. Unchosen authoritative structures. I, I, need, I should have a say in who the people are that have authoritative power. That's a promise of liberalism. So this also then promises autonomy. The, ind the individual determines my own happiness, my own pursuit of happiness. That's inscribed, God bless America, that's inscribed in our founding document, right? The pursuit of happiness. The individual gets to determine our own happiness. It's a philosophy that's based on the pursuit of self-interest. If you read the early developers of liberalism, particularly Thomas Hobbes, who wasn't a liberal himself, he had a very high view of the king, but in Hobbes and in Locke, there's a real honesty about the human condition, which is that we are inherently selfish. And so what we need to do then is create a political philosophy that understands that, that takes that into account, and that plays well with the fact that we are an inherently self-interested people. And so Western liberalism is a philosophy that is based on the pursuit of self-interest, my own economic self-interest, my guild's economic self-interest, my town's economic self-interest, whatever it might be, that we are pursuing our own self-interest. And through that then becomes a, a very important uh, emphasis on the right of the individual. The government can't imp in, in, uh, impose upon the rights of the individual except in the kinds of exceptions that we make about that, about if you break the law, there's things that you do that don't contribute to the polis, then we can deal with you and, and take away some of your rights. But as free people living in a liberal society, we have individual rights. So these are the, the basic assumptions and purposes of, of liberalism. What's the crisis of liberalism? As I mentioned in, his, in the quote from Deneen, he identifies that what's happening right now is this growing realization of the contradictions in liberal political theory. And, and, and Deneen describes that at the core of liberalism, there's a particular faith. There's a particular belief. And that belief is this, that innumerable autonomous individuals pursuing their own interest can create a harmonious what? society. That's crazy. Mindy, yes. 
mean, that sounds like rational egoism. So how close to liberalism is the it's, philosophy of rational egoism? Yeah. Is it just an extension yeah. of liberalism yeah. or like an it intensification is. of it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay, so innumerable autonomous individuals pursuing self-interest, pursuing happiness. Right? This is the wager of liberalism. That all of these autonomous individuals who are pursuing their own self-interest can create a harmonious society. And effectively, what Deneen is saying is, one, if you really look at the history, that's never worked. Because there have been some who have benefited from their own self-interest, and there are others who have been hurt by others' self-interest. So it's never really worked. But what we're seeing now is that it's really starting to not work. And it's because liberalism is moving to its logical conclusion. So let's, let's talk about that now. Okay, so as liberalism promotes the right of the individual to pursue her or his happiness, what happens? Well, inevitably what happens over time is that as all these individuals are pursuing their own happiness, we start to lose any kind of a shared sense of thriving. That what it means for us to thrive is no longer the question, what does it mean for us to thrive? It's what does it mean for me to thrive? And what it means for me to thrive, I get to determine, <coughs> I get to decide, and it's the government's job to make sure that I am not impinged in my pursuit of happiness. And so what's happening is a communal sense of thriving is breaking down into more individualistic senses of thriving. And so all these autonomous, innumerable autonomous actors who have been trained to pursue happiness are doing exactly what we have been trained to do. And those chickens are starting to come home to roost in the way that we see how our politics works and the way that we see how divisions in society are are opening up in, in new ways, power structures are breaking down because the people who have benefited from power now are, that's really starting to be questioned. Why have you benefited from your own self-interest when I haven't? And if your idea is that everyone can pursue their own self-interest, that's an incredibly important and, and, and vital question. Why should one segment benefit in their pursuit of self-interest when others can't. Why should they? So those are the conversations that are happening. Okay, so each individual has the right to determine what it means for that person to thrive. And so then there is this loss of shared sense of thriving, which leads to societal atomization, the kind of narrowing in of self-interest, um, societal division, that opens up with, with that. Yeah, this is what we're seeing that's happening in, in the world around us. All right, now let me walk through the kind of core contradiction of liberalism. Okay, so liberalism seeks to protect individual autonomy. That's the idea, that's the driving idea. Let's reject the idea that there's a monarch and that person is somehow special through a divine right or if you happen to be born into a monarch's family, then you become the ruler next, right? Unless you're a woman. What's, unless you're a woman. Well, in some places, but yeah, primogeniture and all that good stuff. So let's reject all of that for the sake of the individual, for the sake of, uh, of the individual's pursuit of freedom and, and self-guidance uh, uh, and autonomy. So liberalism seeks to protect individual autonomy and guarantee individual rights. Now, if that's the case, then what's the next question? Did you have on your, on your power? Yeah. So for dramatic effect, what's the next question? Well, the next question is, well, who guarantees those rights? And what's the answer? We do. We do not. <laughs> it depends on what you mean by we. Yeah. <laughs> depends on what you mean by we. 
Well, it depends on, it depends on the system. It depends on the system. So let's say in our system, well, in, in kind of Western systems in general. What, so let me propose this. To ensure the individual right, the state is given the maintenance of the individual rights. The state is to protect the individual rights. And so, if you have a, an emphasis on, on individual rights, and in order to ensure those rights, you need a powerful state, then that starts to create some contradictions because a powerful state inevitably, yeah. in some form or fashion, is going to be a threat mm -hmm. to individual rights. Ergo, checks and balances. Ergo, checks and balances, mm -hmm. okay? So this idea of checks and balances. However, as we're seeing the story play out, again, the question is, who do those checks and balances benefit? Who do those checks and balances uh, most enable to pursue their own individual rights? Are the structures in place that have benefited some individuals and groups and, and not benefited other individuals and groups? One of the points that Deneen makes in his book is that the, as, as mobility takes uh, place, as, as technology uh, moves forward, then what's happening is any kind of the, the, the sense of local, the, the norming by a local community, that that is, the, the power of local communities to norm themselves is going away. And as the power of local communities to norm themselves goes away, then that power gets transferred to the broader state. And so you have an increasing in the power of the state. And I'm not here talking about like a conservative versus liberal. I'm not going big government or little government. I'm talking about a, a, a broader thing than that. Even, and we'll see in just a second, even little government, the way that that would be described by a conservative or even a, a, a libertarian, there's a tremendous amount of power that is invested in the state, even if your vision of the state is smaller, with little, little government. So the more power that's given to the state, the more difficult it is to hold the state accountable for its power. The more the state operates, and I'm not, I don't want to get all into like conspiracy theories here and all this, but the more the state can operate in ways that, that isn't visible to the populace, the more money pours into the state, the more seeking of power that pours into the state, the more bureauc the bureaucracy that you have to need to make it work that becomes powerful in its bureaucratic aims that then the populace are caught in that bureaucracy. So here, here's a quote from Deneen. He says, the liberal governments of today would provoke jealousy and amazement from, the, from tyrants of old who can only dream of such extensive capacities for control. Mm -hmm. The liberal governments of today would evoke jealousy from tyrants of old who can only dream of the capacities for control that are there for the liberal state today. So this is what, De what this argument that Deneen is making and, and others are making, is that when you have an emphasis on individualism, inevitably what will happen is you have to have an emphasis on statism. These things aren't in contradiction to one another, they reinforce each other. And what he's saying we're seeing is the loss of a communal understanding of what the state is to be, and therefore a lot of fighting for the power of the state for our own self-interest. And those of us who have benefited from the power of the state um, are fighting to hold on to that power. Those who haven't are fighting to gain that power. And so that's at least a part of what we see that is going on in our political world today. Okay. What I want to suggest, and we'll stop here in just a second and have some conversations, see how, how we're doing, is that the twin crises of liberalism and evangelicalism 
And, and I don't think it's an accident <coughs> that these, you know, evangelical movement that we're talking about in the liberal uh, ph philosophy that we're talking about, I don't think it's an accident that these two are in finding ourselves in crisis together. Um, I think there are similar societal things happening that are also happening in the church, like struggles for power and who has the power of the church benefited and, and what has the church done to people who haven't been in power, who haven't had voice, who haven't had the structures in their favor. These are very much uh, uh, twin conversations that are taking place. So the twin crises of liberalism and evangelicalism, I think, provide us with an important opportunity to reflect on the relation between church and politics, which is what I've been um, doing myself and uh, encouraging us to do and will continue to encourage us to do as this church to take this opportunity in these, this time of, of crisis, crises, to take this opportunity to learn and to reflect and to think about what has been and what does that mean about what is and is to come. How can this help? How can the church go through these difficult times, these difficult conversations, and come out the other side better? So before we move on from here, I just want to stop and, and see what, if there are questions lingering out there, if there are comments, disagreements, things that you're struggling with things that you're wondering about, things that you're scratching your head about. How are we doing? I know this is like a political philosophy lecture, and I don't know if you were expecting that, but uh, it's kind of the way I roll. No. Linda. I was just um, thinking about what if Israel had uh, not asked for a king and theocracy. Yeah. Is we will never know right. until we get to heaven what that would look like. But do you think a <coughs> picture of that was Moses when God gave Moses the commandments? That was a theocracy, wasn't it? God was saying this is the way I'm yeah. going to operate. Yes. So I would say Israel was intended to be a theocracy, yes. not intended to be a monarchy. Right? The, the move of Israel was to ask for a king. They looked around at the nations around them, right. Right? which is fundamentally a problem. They looked around at the nations around them and they wanted to be like those nations. Which if you ask Peter in 1 Peter, don't do that because you're not like that. You're a holy nation. But that's what Israel did. Looked around at the nations around them and said, we want to be like that. And, and God told them, okay, but here's what it's going to mean. And he listed out what it's going to mean. He listed out what was going to happen. And they said, that's fine with us. We're cool with that. Give us a king. He did, and everything that he said was going to happen. That's what happened. And, and, and so Israel was meant to be a theocracy. The church is meant to be a theocracy. The state is not. And I think that's been our problem, one of our problems, problems of, of Christendom, is that we have tried to make states, which are not intended to be theocracies, into theocracies. So if... Evangelicalism is in trouble. Can we go back to the idea of the theocracy for the church? For the church, yes. We're going to talk about that, actually. We're going to talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions, comments, thoughts? So the, so the Me Too, is, let's take an example of the Me Too movement. Yeah. So yeah. there's a over the last hundred years, there's a change in the norms. And so then, so then there's a change in the power structure. And I, I'm just trying to put it all together and yep. we've just been talking about yep. it. I'm, I'm just trying to, so then, but they're also using the, the social system to, to, to push that change as well. Or, well, yes. at least the movement is. Yes. So that's kind of what you're getting at? Is yes. Trying to get us to the point that we're, gonna, which yeah. means we're in crisis because somebody's going to lose, they don't like that, somebody's going to gain, they want it. Right. Okay. <clears throat> right. Okay. Yep. Yeah, and, and, and I think the, you know, what, what this is, so in liberalism, which is 
its intent is for the individual <coughs> to have freedom, that this is the contradiction. The individual have freedom. It, it hasn't worked, and it probably really can't work through a human philosophical system for all individuals to have equal amounts of freedom because of the human heart, because of the way that the human heart is, because of the fallenness of humanity. Um, so therefore, under the cover of liberalism, you have had deeply invested power structures in the state that has benefited certain people. Right? So this is the idea that liberalism is meant to, to throw off aristocracy. But what we have always had is a functional aristocracy. We have the rule by the few over the many. We have that. We call it something else, and we do get to vote, but the in, none of us has any real power over what the state does. And, and that's what some of these people who are reflecting on us are saying is that's not actually getting better. That's accelerating. The power of the state is accelerating. And so what happens then is something that, that uh, we need to be aware of and reflecting on. I say a parallel in the church, and you can see it. In, I don't know if you all have seen what the Houston Chronicle stories this week about sexual abuse in the Southern Baptist yeah. Church. I encourage you to read. There's been an investigative report going on um, that the Houston Chronicle reported on, um, and so when you have power structures in the church, which we have and have had, and they have been. In most of the history of the church, they have been largely male power structures. Then there are things that don't get spoken. There are things that happen that get covered up. There are things that happen that consolidate and perpetuate that power. That inevitably then, there are winners and there are losers. And I, and I, I think that that we have, we have a lot of work to do to figure out who we are as the church, as we've been talking about. I think we also have a lot of work to do to figure out our relationship to the political philosophy of Western liberalism and how maybe that has taken us away from our calling to be the church. And I think in, in, in much of the history of the Western church, there has been an assumption that Western liberalism and Christianity are compatible with one another, and in fact, that Western liberalism grew out of Christianity. I don't think that's true. In fact, when you read the early Western uh, liberal philosophers like Hobbes and like Locke and like Rousseau, they were very intentionally working against the power of the church because the church was a power structure with the monarch and they viewed this as the church and the monarch were perpetuating their power at the expense of individuals, the expense of people. So um, anyway, that's, a, that's a, a, another conversation for another time, but I think the relationship between, between a, a biblical anthropology, what the Bible says it means to be human, and what Western liberal philosophy says to be human I think I've said this before in some other of these contexts, but what if life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and take up your cross and follow me aren't compatible with one another? Then what do we do as followers of Christ? And what if the way that we understand what Jesus has called us to is more influenced by life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness than take up your cross and follow me? Amen. What if there's another political philosophy that is to rule the church that we're not being ruled by because we've been ruled by the political philosophy of Western liberalism? So we're that's thinking. the Sabbath politics that I did, and I'm, that's, I'm working on that in some of my work on, on a comparative of these different visions of what it means to be human. I think the Bible, the biblical vision of what it means to be human and the Western liberal philosophical vision of what it means to be human aren't compatible with one another. And we need to do some work on that. <laughs> uh, Rick, and then we'll come over here to Doug. So, 
do you see the proliferation of um, evangelical denominations or just Protestant denominations as being driven by Western liberalism? Not wholly, because that started before Western liberalism, but certainly Western liberalism contributes to an acceleration of that. Yeah. Yeah. Doug. You said winners and losers. I use those that term. Yeah. And that's um, a result of Western liberalism. And I think, well, I agree with that. Uh, what I'm wondering is if those two terms are, um, are ethically neutral or not. In other words, are the losers wrong right, and the right. winners exploitative? Right. Uh, I mean, I don't think they, they are. I, I think maybe we've got to appeal to some of the winners to say, um, if everybody's better off, then it's good for you too. That's the definition of everybody. Yeah. But so this is neutral. You know, yeah. So this is actually, uh, John Locke talks about that in his second treatise on government. He talks about the fact that the, the people who will drive liberalism are what he calls the industrious and the rational. Okay. Which tells you a little bit about kind of the philosophy of the time. But the people who work hard yeah. will be the wealth creators. Because yeah. inherent in, in Locke, inherent in this philosophy, is a coupling of, of a certain vision of economics and liberalism. Liberalism can only work if there's economic wealth. Because you can only have freedom to determine your own happiness if you have the means to do so. And so what Locke was saying was there will be some who drive that. And, and so they will, through their industriousness, through their wealth, they will be wealth creators. They will have more wealth than others, but it's the idea of uh, a rising tide will floats lift all boats. floats all boats, right? We'll, we'll lift all the, sh all the ships. But even the people who aren't industrious will benefit from the work of the industrious and will be okay with their being wealthy and, and less wealthy because they're better off than they were before. But that hasn't always happened, has it? But that hasn't always happened, right. right. That hasn't always happened. And, and this is the, the rich and the poor divide now. Okay, maybe you could be cool with that if there's a, a certain divide between the rich and the poor, but when 1% of people own 66% per, of the wealth, people start to wonder, is this really working for everybody? Yeah, is right. Jeff Bezos <laughs> so much smarter and more industrious and rational than everyone else that he ought to have billions and billions and billions of dollars? Now, again, I'm not here to, at this point, kind of pronounce what we ought to do with that. I'm just saying these are, again, these are the conversations that are happening, and these are the Okay, that was what Locke said would happen. But again, liberalism was developed in a very particular time, in a very particular place. It's, it's had development over time. But, but now, some of those things that were promised aren't bearing out. So what do we do with that? So, all right, how are we doing? Doing all right? Let's go. Let's go, all right. So, Christendom Church. And we think in our thinking about the relationship between church and state, the Christendom church, the, the church that was in power through the era of Christendom for the last 1,500 years, has been operating on a foundational assumption regarding the relationship of the church to the state. And the assumption is this. The assumption is that Christianity contains a political theory that is to be translated into the structures of the state. Christianity contains a political theory that is to be translated into the structures of the state. That as we read the scriptures, as we read how God ordered Israel and the law that God gave to Israel, that law, the church ought to take and apply to the state and the culture within which the church lives. So the assumption here is that Christianity has a political theory, a political philosophy. The conservative moral majority and the liberal bringing in the kingdom visions share this assumption that 
a political, the a political philosophy from the scriptures can be and ought to be applied more broadly to the culture, to the state in which we live. I think that the current crises have to drive us to question that assumption. I think what we are living through now is a time in which we have to question the assumption that Christianity contains a political theory for the state. So let, me, let me put it this way. What if, what if the scriptures don't contain a political philosophy that is intended to guide the rule of the nation state in which the church lives? What if the scriptures don't have a set out political philosophy to guide the rule of the nation state? Wouldn't the scripture be a social philosophy rather than a political philosophy? So, um, I think and, it, it and can be the, applied then, both ways. But can they overlap? I think they overlap, because if you're talking about the social, the polis, then how do we organize that polis? Mm -hmm. How do we structure that polis? I would suggest that the scriptures don't contain a social philosophy for the culture either. And let me, let me explain why. Let me explain what I mean by that. I think that the scriptures have a very clear vision of Israel as a covenant polis, living under the rule of God. Covenant relationship with God as his polis. I think the scriptures contain a vision of the church as a covenant polis, living under God's rule. I don't think that the scriptures have a vision of the nation state as a covenant polis under God's rule. I don't think that the scriptures envision that nation states <coughs> will live in covenant community the way that Israel did or the way that the church is called to do. You look like you wanted to say something, Wayne. Am I reading you right, or you just... Okay, all right. So I think there is a clear vision in the scripture of how Israel is to organize themselves in relation to Yahweh because they're in a covenant relationship with Yahweh. That brings an ordering of the polis of Israel. I think that there is a vision in the scriptures of how the church ought to order itself as a community under the rule of God because we are in covenant relationship with Yahweh through Jesus Christ. I don't think there's a vision in the scriptures of nation states other than Israel, who is a unique state. Nation states other than Israel, I don't think that there's a vision of the nation state as a covenant polis under God's rule. Dave. You, you covered this in the last uh, class, but I mean that's what that's what the um, conservatives would argue, or the, 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 the uh, Christian young people would argue that the United States was right and should have that covenant. Right, and that and that, that goes back to the the founding of the United States as a, a colony of England. The city set on a hill. John with. Winthrop's speech that he gave before they landed, that we are the city set on a hill, we have an errand in the wilderness to be a, a, a light that shines. This nation is going to be a covenant nation that will um, declare to the other nations what it looks like to live in a covenant relationship with Yahweh. But from the very beginning, of the founding of our country, there's been a confusion between the nation and the church. Mm -hmm. And you have to go all the way back to, to um, the 300s when... Back, yeah, to Constantine. Yeah. 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 And you're arguing that that was a big mistake. Yes. Yeah. A misunderstanding, a confusion of God's program. <coughs> I, think, I think God has, well, 
I'll hold off on that. I, I, God does stuff through the state. Okay? I, I, I think God uses the state for his purposes. The state, though, is not a covenant partner of Yahweh in his mission. The church is. Did I see a hand over here? No? Well, since you invited <laughs> <laughs> I may regret this. <laughs> no, I was just thinking that I had a wonderful opportunity for about three years. Arthur Fleming was president of the National Council of Churches. And he would time and again act on the idea that we created the image of God. And if you give people enough freedom, they would choose rightly. Mm. And it cost him dearly. Mm. I mean, people continually <laughs> chose wrongly. Did, 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 <laughs> yeah. Let them do it, and they would do it, and they would. I mean, it really cost him the presidency of the college because mm-hmm. things just went. And I think he really was working out that philosophy that right. people will make right choices. Right. And he would argue with me that my problem was that I had been raised in this idea that sin is pervasive. We had more arguments about that. Than, than yeah. Good discussions. But right. He, he really believed yeah. that people would do right and timely again. They did. Well. Yeah. Well, and that, as a, a fundamental tenet of the anthropology of Western liberalism, is the innate goodness of people. Um, I think people were created good, but we have fallen. And there are good things that we do as fallen people. There's bad things that we do as fallen people. And that fault line is in the middle of me. And it's in the middle of all of us. Um, But if you assume the innate goodness of humanity and therefore deny sin, um, well, then you have to figure out how the world, why is the world like it is? Okay, um, so this might be beating a dead horse at this point in time, but I'm happy to do that. It is not the job of the church to ensure the moral majority of the nation state. It's not our job. It's not the job of the church to bring in the kingdom of God via the structures of the nation state. I don't think that's our job. Because the state is not the kingdom of God, and the state can't be the kingdom of God. That's not how the state is seen in the biblical story. That's not how we are to see it. The state, because the state is not the covenant community of God's kingdom rule. The church is the covenant community of God's kingdom rule, which means that we have to think of the church as a distinct political community. We are a polis. The church is a polis. And we dwell within another polis, a series of poli, right? We have local polis, we have state polis, we have national polis. But the church is our fundamental polis. It's our people. It is a holy nation. Back to Peter. You, who are exiles, and who are scattered through Bithynia, Cappadocia, Galatia, places that Peter talks about, you who are exiles are, as exiles, a holy nation together. You're gathered under the rule of God. You are scattered in your earthly life, but you are gathered as a holy nation under God. We are, therefore, a people (coughs) set apart. We have a, as the church, we have a core common object of our love, which is not an idea, it's not a principle, it's not a symbol. The common object of our love is Jesus Christ. Paul never tires of talking about unity in the church, and he always defines that. And how does he define that? Unity in Christ. In Christ, in Christ, in Christ. Paul talks about being in Christ all the time. 
you are in Christ. That's your identity. That's what binds you to your holy nation is that you have the common object of love of Jesus Christ. Which is what binds us to our sisters and our brothers in the church around the world. That we are one in Christ. That we are a holy nation. I, I'm sure I've said this before, but one of the joys of my life is when I get to go to other countries and step into churches and go be with sisters and brothers in Christ in, in India, in Africa, in the Philippines, in Latin America, Europe, places I've been, step into churches and know this is my nation. I don't speak their language. I don't have the same color skin. I don't have the same experiences. I'm, I, I'm a very different person. I've had a very different life. But we have a common object of love, and that binds us closer than anything else. Amen. And we'll talk about the church and racism next week. And at the heart of our problem with racism is that we have trampled on Christ being the common object of our love. And we have made all kinds of other things the common object of our love, which has made us to have an attitude towards people who are different than us that has contributed to this tremendous defect, sin, in the life of the church, of racism. So Christ as our identity and our common object fundamentally sets the church apart as a distinct polis. We are a holy nation with a common object of love that we share with our sisters and brothers in Christ. He must unify us. And anything that separates us has to be done away with. That's why Paul says, you are no, there is no longer Jew, nor Gentile, nor slave, nor free, nor male, nor female. He's not saying that you lose those human identity markers. He's saying you do not consider one another according to those identity markers anymore because you are in Christ. That is your common object of love. So what does this mean regarding the relation of the church to the nation state? What is our presence in the politics of the nation state? I've got a few more things to say here, but we are out of time. So we'll pick up here. I, I want to I wanna talk next, as we start next week, I'm going to make a distinction between the kingdom of God and the common good. And I think one of the problems that we have right now in the church is we have conflated the kingdom of God and the common good. And then we think about our presence as the kingdom of God, representatives of the kingdom of God. We are a holy nation. We're distinct. But... We also live in society, and we are to participate in the common good of the society, but those are different things, and in too much theology, in, in my view right now, those things have been conflated with one another, and I think we're, we, we lose some things about the church when we conflate the kingdom of God and the common good. But we'll talk about that starting off next week, and then that'll lead us into talking about uh, the church and race and racism. Sound good? Let me pray. Father, thanks again for this time. I thank you for these uh, folks and their patience to uh, put up with me and these things. And I pray, God, that as we reflect on these things together, that, uh, again, as, as I prayed to start, that you would be giving us a clear vision, a sense of what it means for us to be a holy nation, to be your church have clarity about who we are and, and therefore what we're called to do, that Christ might be glorified, that our life as a church would witness well to the world around us who Jesus is. May we repent of all those things we need to repent of by which we have not presented Jesus well. May your spirit build us up. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. 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 Yeah. All right. So this is Micah's birthday, huh? It is Micah's birthday. Yes. Eleven years. He is eleven years old this very day.